Welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church of Ann Arbor. My name is Claire Castleman. My name is Lisa Hess. We've been members of the church for a little bit over a year, and we felt so welcomed. And we trust that if you're looking for a church home, that you will feel equally as welcomed. Grace and peace. Grace and peace. Welcome once again to worship at First United Methodist Church of Ann Arbor. Or if you're visiting us for the first time, we welcome you and hope you'll find this a great worshiping experience. My name is Reverend Nancy Lynn, and I'm the senior pastor here. And joining me is... Nick Berlanga, and I am the associate pastor. We would love to know that you are worshiping with us. So if you're watching on YouTube, there is a link where you can note your attendance and give us feedback. Or if you're watching on Facebook or on the website, um, there's a link on the website as well. Joining us is our friend. Tim Kobler, and I'm the chaplain of the Wesley Foundation, the United Methodist Campus Ministry. And our worship service is moving into an asynchronous mode. It's a, a worship service very much like this one where it is pre-recorded and on YouTube and on Facebook and on Instagram, uh, IGTV. So look on Sundays for the Living Room Worship Service from the Wesley Foundation. Great, thanks, Tim. Finally, I wanna say a word of thanks to everyone who participated in the crop walk, both those who walked and those who supported them. It was a great success and a wonderful way to be together safely this year and to support our community. So thank you very much to all of you. Now I invite you to take a few moments of reflection and meditation as we listen to the prelude.
Will you please join me in the call to worship? Loving and sustaining God. These are times of great turmoil and stress. Help, Help us, us to find, find your peace in, in the midst, midst of, of the storm. storm. These are times of grief and sorrow. Guide us in grieving and lamenting our losses. These are times of polarization and division between siblings in Christ. Show us the way to respect and unity in difference. The future is uncertain and fear is ever present. We surrender all our worries into your care. We depend on our faith to see us through. Give, Give us, us a spirit, spirit of courage, of courage and, perseverance, and perseverance, and may, may we know, know you are always with us. Amen. Our scripture reading is from Luke, chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Hey, how's it going? How are you doing today? It's good to see you. I'm Pastor Nick. You know, this is a beautiful day for a run. As a matter of fact, you may not realize it, but I love running. And this time of year is the time of year when I normally run in the Free Press Marathon. Now, I have run a couple of half marathons. And let me tell you, those are hard. I got this medal for one of them. A half marathon is over 13 miles of running. If you ever want to know how far 13 miles is, Ask your mom and dad in the car to start checking how long it takes to go 13 miles and for them to let you know when you hit 13 miles so you can see how big that is. You know, thinking about running a half marathon reminds me of our scripture for today about the persistent widow. Now, the word persistent, you may not know what that means. It just means someone who doesn't give up up. Someone who keeps trying even when it gets hard. And in our scripture today, we have a woman who doesn't give up. She keeps going. You know, that kind of reminds me of the secret to running a half marathon. You want to know what the secret is? Don't share it with anybody. But it's don't quit. Yep, just keep going. As long as you keep going, eventually you will hit 13.1 miles. You know, not quitting is also good when we think about working for God, about doing good for others, and about changing things that we know are wrong. It's easy to quit when it gets hard or to give up, but God wants us to be like the persistent widow, to keep going even when it's hard, because eventually we will solve the problem we're working on. I know you can be persistent. I know you can keep going and not give up. Let's pray. 
God, thank you for working with us, for being with us as we tackle big things and work on hard projects because we know you're going to help us be successful. We ask that you take care of our church, that you continue to take care of our families, and that you keep us safe. Well, I should probably start running before the rain comes. So I'm going to get going. I will see you next week. Bye. Watching the Supreme Court confirmation hearings this week, I was reminded about how back in 2017, a debate over the confirmation of Senator Jeff Sessions as Attorney General led to a new rallying cry for feminists across the country. Maybe you remember, Senator Elizabeth Warren was arguing against confirmation of Sessions and began to read a letter from Coretta Scott King that was written in 1986 in objection to Sessions' nomination as a federal court judge. The letter criticized Sessions for impeding the black vote. Well, while reading the letter, Warren was interrupted first by the presiding chair, Steve Daines, and then by Mitch McConnell, each claiming she was breaking a Senate rule that prohibits senators from ascribing to another senator any conduct or motive unworthy or unbecoming of a senator. Well, the Senate then decided to silence Warren, and she was not allowed to speak for the rest of the hearings. After the vote, Senator McConnell said, Senator Warren was giving a lengthy speech. She appeared to violate the rule. She was warned. She was given an explanation. Nevertheless, she persisted. <laughs> Suddenly the words, nevertheless, she persisted, began to appear all over the internet, on t-shirts and coffee mugs. The phrase was picked up by women across the country who have long struggled to have their voices heard. Author Valerie Schultz wrote in America, the Jes Jesuit Review of Faith and Culture, it is a phrase we women embrace because persistence is what we do. We women persist. Isn't that our job? Throughout history, we have persisted in our quest for respect, for justice, for equal rights, for suffrage, for education, for enfranchisement, for recognition, for making our voices heard. In the face of violence, of op opposition, of ridicule, of belittlement, even of jail time. Nevertheless, we have persisted. And so it was with the widow in the parable we just heard for our scripture reading today. We're nearing the end of our sermon series entitled Courageous Faith, in which we're learning about characters in the Bible who are called to draw on their courage in order to do what God has called them to do. We've looked at such varied figures as Abraham and the courage to leave what is familiar to embrace something new, Shifra and Pua and the courage to do what's right, Barnabas and the courage to break down barriers, and Amos and the courage to speak truth to power. This week, we'll take a look at the courage to persist through the eyes of a woman known only as the persistent widow. In Jewish culture during Jesus' time, widows were among the most vulnerable members of society. So it would be quite unusual for them to go to the high court and plead their own case in front of the judge. Since this particular woman does just that, she probably doesn't have a son or a brother to go for her. That, in turn, means that she doesn't have a fam male family member to care for her since her husband's death. And that puts her at risk of living on the streets, destitute, and starving. 
We don't know the exact details of her case. It's quite possible that she is seeking to get her dowry back from her husband's family so that she has something to live on. But this judge, who neither feared God nor had respect for people, really doesn't seem to care. She is nothing but an irritant to him. And in a system in which he has power and she has none, he chooses to ignore her cries for help. But this is not just any widow. She is not going to accept that. William Herzog, a scholar of the social and historical context of Jesus' life, writes, all that is required of her for the system of injustice to work is her silence. Yet that is precisely what she fails to offer. This system expects her to be intimidated by his power, to accept her fate, to keep her mouth shut. Instead, she goes back to the judge over and over and over again. She keeps asking, keeps pushing, keeps crying out, until finally, probably more from embarrassment or irritation than compassion, the judge breaks down. He grants her the justice she seeks, the basic rights and protections that God commands for widows and orphans in Jewish law. This kind of persistence takes tremendous courage. And it's a kind of courage we're all in need of right now. In the midst of a global pandemic which has killed more than a million people worldwide and more than 215,000 in the United States alone, just getting up and going about the daily work of life has become hard sometimes. In the middle of a year which has highlighted so many different kinds of injustice in our country, avoiding despair takes effort when it seems to lurk behind every corner. And those are just some of our communal challenges. Each of us has personal stories as well. The challenge of going on after losing a friend or partner. The challenge of dealing with a broken relationship and how to communicate when you have such different views. The hopelessness we may feel when we face life with depression, addiction, or an incurable disease. Yet in this parable, Jesus encourages us to persist, to find the courage to acknowledge the struggle and also to keep going. So how? When it feels as though a vaccine for COVID is light years away, when a just and compassionate society for all God's people seems like a pipe dream, when health and wholeness feel unreachable, where do we find the courage to persist? In recent years, researchers have found that the quality which enables us to persist is, in fact, resilience. And thankfully, Resilience is something we can actually foster in ourselves. So according to a New York Times article, Dr. Stephen Southwick, who's the professor emeritus of psychiatry, PTSD, and resilience at Yale University School of Medicine, has interviewed a large number of very resilient people, people who have experienced real adversity or trauma, and then come through it successfully. And he has discovered that they have several characteristics in common. First, they have a positive and realistic outlook. Without denying the negative, they seek out what positives can come from a negative situation. They accept what they can't change and focus their energy on what they can. So in the case of the persistent widow, she recognizes that she is in a dire situation. She lives in a society in which she has very little power. But she also knows what she can do to try to create a better outcome for herself. 
So she goes to the judge over and over again. Similarly, we have power to affect positive change. We can wear masks, we can vote, we can seek out help when we need it. In addition, resilient people have a strong sense of what is right and what is wrong, and they use that moral compass for decision-making. The persistent widow knows that under Jewish law, God calls the community to care for widows. She has every reason to expect that her call for justice will be heard and also to be angered by the judge's indifference. Her sense of what is right motivates her to keep trying. We too have a moral code, a sense of right and wrong taught to us by Jesus that can guide us in our decisions every day. A third characteristic of resilient people is that they believe in something greater than themselves. They have a spiritual or religious life that feeds their courage and strength. When we understand the social context of the persistent widow, we realize that it is her faith in God's promise of justice that keeps her going. Much like that same promise keeps us going today. There are some of the characteristics of resilient people that Dr. Southwick discovered that are not as evident in the persistent widow, but they are still qualities we can foster in ourselves. For example, resilient people give of themselves and find meaning and purpose in life through helping others. In fact, they are, in general, people who have a meaningful mission in their lives. And finally, they have some sort of social support system. For example, a church or family and friends. It's interesting to note that these are all qualities that Jesus had himself. He certainly was a person who lived with purpose and mission. He was committed to helping and healing those in need. He had a deep faith that gave him strength and a strong moral compass that guided his teaching and his life. He created a community, a social support system for himself as he called the disciples to follow him. And finally, he certainly had a positive and realistic outlook. He knew that what he was teaching and the decisions he was making would anger the Jewish and Roman authorities. But he truly believed that what he was doing would transform the world. Despite the rejection of the people in his hometown, the testing and threats from those in power, and of course, ultimately, his sentence of crucifixion, he just kept going. So where do you find yourself in this picture? What are the challenges that make it difficult for you to keep going, to keep trying? Which of these characteristics of resilient people do you have? Which do you think you might need to foster, nurture, or grow? What do you need more of? in order to persist. In the end, the courage to persist, like so many other kinds of courage we've talked about in this series, comes from God's promise of hope. We are people of hope. Our church is a community of hope. And the central event of our faith, the resurrection, is God's ultimate promise of hope. The resurrection is God's promise that nothing that challenges or overpowers or deflates us, nothing that depresses, worries, or frightens us, nothing that intimidates or tempts us, nothing will stop God's work for good and wholeness and love in the world. So yes, there may be a global pandemic. Injustice, 
surrounds us and for others oppresses. So much of our lives may feel out of control. Nevertheless, God persists, and so may we. Amen. Be strong and take courage and press on to the Lord. Be very courageous and press on, press on, press on. For you will inherit this good land which is Christ. For God will be with you. Strong and take courage and press on to the Lord. Be very courageous and press on, press on, press on. This week, we're hearing about the persistent widow, and I want to thank you for your persistence. In this time where there has been so much change, it would have been easy to say, I can't give. But you haven't said that. You have been persistent in continuing to give to the church, and for that I say thank you. And you have allowed the church to be persistent in its ministries, its offerings, in the way that we meet our community. And with your gifts, we've been able to be inventive, to come up with new ideas, ideas that will sustain us as we move into the future. I invite you now to continue to give. And if you're a first-time giver, I say thank you. We appreciate that you have made this commitment.
Will you join me in prayer? Loving God, you call us to learn to live in healthy relationship with one another. 
Political tensions have deepened and have led to violence and unrest in many places around the world. We seek to find ways of living as beloved community in the wake of disordered and inconsistent pandemic responses and racial inequalities. You call us to learn to live in healthy relationship with your creation. Storms and hurricanes have proven deadly for many around the world, yet so many of us refuse to acknowledge the ways our behavior affects the climate of this world we call home. The Pacific waters along the shore of Russia are so polluted that the water is discolored and dead sea life washes onto the shore every day. But so many of us fail to connect our well-being and our very survival with good stewardship of the environment. You call us to learn to live in healthy relationship with you. Open our eyes to see you in the faces of all who suffer. You call us to learn, to teach, and to grow in our faith in you and in our love for others. Teach us respect and fill our hearts with the love of Christ. Form us so that whatever we do, we might do everything in the name of Christ. And as your children, we unite our voices together as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now may the God of the persistent widow, the one we call creator, sustainer, and redeemer, grant you courage and grant you strength that you might persist and we might together make this a better world. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>